Hi there, my name by birth is Alex William Smith. I'm better known to many people as Jonathan Royal Hypnotist. My full story in relation to Wrongful Conviction Day, uh, which takes place on the 2nd of October 2023, can be seen at circusofthemind.net. This all interrelates um, with the fact that in the previous week, Amazon Prime Video have also released a three-part documentary, The Fake Shake, about Rupert Murdoch's disgraced fake shake, Mazam and Mood. Here's the thing. In 1998, I set out to try and expose Mahmood's dishonesty. That's all I thought it was at the time, editing tapes to make it look like people had said things they hadn't, or to look like they hadn't said things that they had, or that they'd done things they hadn't, or that they hadn't done things that they actually had. In other words, he framed things to make people look guilty of stuff that they either hadn't done, or hadn't said, or never intended to, because they socially engineered the entire situation. And I was going to go to a rival newspaper afterwards with my recordings, and expose this is dishonesty. It turns out, though, that Mahmood and his team at the News of the World at the time discovered what I was up to and were always one, in fact, five, probably ten steps ahead of me. And as a result, and I now know in the past couple of years, evidence has come to light that unlawful information gathering and phone hacking techniques were used, uh, as well as information from my former publicist who... Um, ended up being on their payroll and double crossing me, that they knew that I knew who Mazza Mahmood was and that my intention was to expose his dishonest techniques. Little did I know how deep the rabbit hole already went and everything else that was going on. I did not know at the time that phone hacking was being used, but now there's evidence that yes, it was. I did not know that unlawful information gathering techniques and private investigators were being used, but heck, it was. I did not know in 1998 when I set out to expose him that the police and the Crown Prosecution Service already knew he could not and should not be trusted. But it turns out that was the fact. So here's the thing. At circusofthemind.net, you can see why I say that my conviction uh, as a result of the 1998 attempt to expose Muslim Mahmoud backfiring and them using manipulation, lies, editing tapes, um supplying money up front to make a crime possible that would never have occurred otherwise, threats and intimidation behind the scenes, and it now turns out evidence that drugging me and other people into making them more flexible, more manipulable, more compliant, were all elements of many, many things that were done to cause crimes that would never have happened otherwise. Meaning there are dozens of people uh, dozens and dozens of people uh, who sustain convictions as a result of fake shake stories that were basically wrongful convictions. They should now be considered unsafe, especially when a few things are considered. Namely, there is now evidence that Mahmood and his team were using uh, phone hacking illegally. They were also using unlawful information gathering and private investigators who could be multiple steps ahead of people and use that to socially engineer and behind the scenes use manipulation dishonesty and deception, often uh, using bribery and payments to people that the pe person knew to also influence and persuade and manipulate them behind the scenes, none of which was ever mentioned in any of the stories. And then editing of tapes. This is something it turns out that the Crown Prosecution Service knew about at least as far back as 1999, when the case of Rodri Giggs, the fo famous footballer's brother, collapsed because the CPS decided they could no longer um, rely on the recordings of Mazza Mahmood. But it gets worse than that, you see. In 1994, it turns out, thanks to disclosures in the Mitville, which is the phone hacking cases and unlawful information gathering cases running through the High Court, documents have been disclosed, documents between the Metropolitan Police and the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, illustrating that they both communicated with each other in 1994 in relation to a collapsed 1992 uh, or 93 thereabouts uh, trial involving Mahmood as the chief witness, where they concluded that he could not and should not any further ever be considered a witness of truth. And yet, despite having made those assertions to each other, they relied on his evidence till 2014. Why is that? Does it have any link with the fact of Rebecca Brooks, formerly Wade, um, other news group executives and Mazza Mahmood himself 
having links with police officers of a corrupt nature. For example, the mood in the police um, in Leveson bragged about, um, or police investigation rather, as you can see on Circus of the Mind.net, bragged about having bent police officers in his pocket. Rebecca Books um, admitted at the Leveson inquiry that uh, they paid the police uh, for information and for stories. All of these things should be examined further and would have been by Leveson Inquiry Part 2. But hey, the Conservative government swept that under the carpet and cancelled it, despite Sir Brian Leveson saying that Part 2 was needed more than ever. In fact, Matt Hancock lied about that in the Houses of Parliament, giving the impression Sir Brian Leveson, trying to give the impression Sir Brian Leveson had said Part 2 should be cancelled. It wasn't true. He said the scope of it should actually be widened. And one of the main focuses should have been Mazama Mood. Uh, his illegal techniques, his dishonesty, and also links to police uh, and other corruption. All of reasons why I, um, contribute to why I say I was wrongfully convicted and numerous other fake shake victims such as John Alford, Herbie Hydes, the Earl of Hardwick, Stephen Twaits, and a whole bunch of other people were wrongfully convicted as well. Heck, the so-called evidence in my case, the counterfeit coins, the alleged counterfeit coins that I was manipulated in going and picking up. And that's all I did. I went and picked them up from a place that Mahmoud's associates had told me where to get them from. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to do it. And they supplied the money up front to make it possible to collect them. And I knew they'd never get into public circulation. I knew they'd get given to the police. And so I'd cooperate with the police as I did and help bring some real criminals to justice. That was the uh, intention. And heck, it now turns out I was drugged. There's evidence. You can see that the sworn witness statement from Steve Grayson, one of Mahmoud's former associates, is at circusofthemind.net. There's evidence that I was drugged and thus more compliant and suggestible and easily manipulated along with the behind the scenes threats that were going on into going and picking up those coins from the place they told me where to get them using the money they gave me up front to make it possible. In other words, they were all levels of the supply chain in the same way as they were all levels of the supply chain of the drugs that um, Emma Morgan um, ultimately just picked up and delivered as is detailed in the fake shake Amazon Prime documentary on Amazon Prime right now. Further, in terms of those coins, at one of the meetings, I bragged that I was acting the part of a so-called criminal in order to get my recordings to expose my mood, as fully explained at Circus of the Mind.net. I reached into my pocket when asked about counterfeit money and pulled out three pound coins, genuine pound coins I had in my pocket, and then pretended they were fake and handed them over. That's three coins on... on one meeting. Eventually, once they told me where to obtain coins from and supplied the money up front and manipulated me into going and picking them up, I collected and delivered 1,000 coins. 1,000 plus three is 1,003. Yet, as you can see at circusofthemind.net, suddenly police and court documents talk about three coins on the first occasion and 996 or 997 on the second occasion, making 1,000 in total. Three coins go missing. Is that because Mahmood realised those three coins from the first meeting being genuine were calling to question the validity of his story? Further, those thousand coins that were delivered were delivered um, nine days before they were ever handed over to the police by Mahmood and his team. There is no proof of the chain of evidence or safety of that chain of evidence what happened to those coins during the nine days? Why did it take nine co days to get them to the police? Further, a GDPR request has shown that the Royal Mint do keep records from that time period. They've confirmed that they do and they have records from that time period. But nothing connected to my name or to Mazama Mood, the fake shake, News of the World, the CPS or the police around the date relevant to my case. Is that because they just took wholesale uh, the word of the disgraced fake shake? of them being genuine and didn't actually bother to check them. It does appear that way, which sounds laughable and ridiculous. And you go, well, that could never have happened, surely. But remember, the CPS and the police knew from 1999 that the validity of his tape recordings, video recordings and other recordings being manipulated and edited that had been accused of previously as well is what caused the Roger Giggs case to collapse in 1999 and yet they never disclosed that to any of us fake shake victims ever at any time including up to this present day in 2023 and they knew from 1994 
that he could not and should not ever be considered a witness of truth in any further cases. Documents exist of the police and CPS communicating with each other, stating that categorically. Dated 1994. So why did they carry on doing so? And why was that never disclosed to me or any other of the fake Sheikh Mazen Mahmood victims? In my case, you see, he ended up knowing, I didn't know, but because they were using phone hacking, unlawful information gathering, illegal private investigators, and paying behind the scenes sources, such as my former publicist, so that there was manipulation going on from all sides, it turns out that they knew that I knew who he was. Surely they should have walked away from it the moment they realised that it was my intention to expose his dishonesty. But no, instead they decided to manipulate things to try and make me look as bad as possible. Is this because uh, one of the reasons why they never contacted me the day before the story appeared? As you'll see in the fake shake documentary on Amazon Prime, it was routine the day before the story would appear in the news of the world to ring up the victim um, and say, hey, you're going to be in the news of the world. Have you got a comment? I was never called. Is that because they knew full well that my response would have been, hey, I've got recordings as well, and I'm going to show that you've been dishonest. Um, more than likely, especially when you consider, as you can see at circusofthemind.net, that in a Manchester Evening News article of March 1999, the day after I changed my plea on the first day of trial, due to bad advice I now know at the time, uh, from not guilty, as I was always pleading, uh, until the first day of trial where I changed it to guilty with mitigating circumstances, all explained at circusofthemind.net, that... Um, The Manchester Evening News reported that the judge said this is not an ordinary case. He accepted the fact that there was a motivation of gaining publicity. In other words, he accepted the fact I knew who Mahmood was and that I was trying to expose his dishonesty. Was it a fact that the News of the World and Mazza Mahmood wanted to distance themselves from those comments by the judge uh, as much as possible? Is that why they never reported or bragged about the fact that a conviction had resulted? Because normally, after a conviction resulted, after one of their stories, they bragged about it in the paper. Never happened with the case of me. Is that because they wanted to not draw attention to the fact the judge accepted it was not an ordinary case? The judge accepted, as reported by Manchester Evening News, the focus was publicity. And that ultimately, all parties knew that uh, I knew who my mood was. And it was only, I had no criminal intentions. My only intention was to um, expose the truth as I understood it to be at the time, which was to do with editing tapes and telling lies. It's actually a bigger rabbit hole than I realised because in the past couple of years it's come to light that Mahmood was using phone hacking, unlawful information gathering techniques, the use of illegal private investigators, paying people behind the scenes who people knew to manipulate them into doing things. And of course, as we do know and did know, and the CPS knew from 1999, because of the collapse of the Roger Giggs case, editing tapes to make it look like people said or did things they hadn't done or that they hadn't done or said things that they had that could have made them look as they were genuinely innocent and with no intention of breaking any crime. Any crimes that did occur were minor and were such that the victims involved were manipulated into it, entrapped into it, socially engineered into it with threats and intimidation behind the scenes and, um, you know, dangling carrots of you'll have multi-million pound uh, film contracts like Talisa was, or in my case, it was the um, dangled carrot of you'll end up with television contracts in the Middle East and in Dubai and all this kind of stuff. His modest operandi with everyone was pretty much the same. Lying, deception, and as we now know, phone hacking, unlawful information gathering techniques. And it also raises the question in my case, why in the year 2000, two years after the story they did, and um, one year after I was released from prison, did they not report, when reporting on the release of my autobiography, on the fact that they'd gained a conviction? They didn't mention it at all, and yet they ran a story about my autobiography release, which contains chapters about how I attempted to expose uh, Mazza Mahmood. You can see all the links to this on circusofthemind.net. The evidence is there. It raises questions galore. Ultimately, the one that raises the biggest questions is, 
is why are any of these convictions considered safe when the people were manipulated, when there were people were lied to, when there was no public interest justification for secret filming to take place because these crimes would never have occurred without Mahmoud's team making the things happen. People did not have previous history of doing these things. So there was no public interest um, excuse for A, Mahmoud to break the law in the way that he did. And he bragged about never getting um, done for breaking the law and buying drugs and doing things that would normally be considered illegal because he claimed the reason he never got done for it is because it was in the public interest. I suspect it's likely more to do with the fact that Rebecca Brooks and Mahmoud themselves, between them, Mahmoud bragged of having been police officers in his pocket and Brooks has talked about paying police officers. You can see more about this at circusofthemind.net. The cesspit of um, corruption surrounding all this is beyond belief and even um, implicates Mahmoud's name numerous times in the published findings of the Daniel Morgan murder inquiry report, Britain's most investigated murder that as yet is unsolved. I could go on and on, there's so much to tell you, but it's all laid out with the evidence, the facts and the proof at circusofthemind.net. I encourage you to share this video far and wide. Please lobby your MP and say you want them to lobby Parliament to reinstate part two of the Levison inquiry. Part two would deal with police corruption, corruption um, that may or may not exist in the Crown Prosecution Service and between the two and high ranking officials and politicians and how they all link together. And also, if they follow Sir Brian Levison's recommendations, would have a particular focus on victims like myself, like John Alford, like Herbie Hydes, like Emma Morgan, like the Earl of Hardwick and a whole bunch of other people, victims of the fake shake, Maza Mahmood, and with the evidence that's now come to light that he drugged people with a GHB style drug, the st witness statement from one of his former associates, Steve Grayson, is at circusofthemind.net, that he phone hacked using lawful information gathering and he bragged about not getting done for breaking the law and yet various judges over the years and various high ranking officials said that he should be investigated by the Crown Prosecution Service for doing such things. This was stated in the drop case of um, Roger Giggs in 99. The judge wanted the CPS to investigate Mahmood for selling drugs. But they turned a blind eye. Why? When they knew back in 1994, he could not and should not be trusted as a witness of truth. So many questions, so few answers. And uh, yeah, Monday, the 2nd of October, 2023 is International Wrongly Convicted Day. Well, the vast majority, if not all, because there may have been one or two people who actually Mahmoud came across who genuinely... Um, did have a, 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 a career criminal background. But the vast majority, 95% or more, um, were manipulated into doing things that would never have occurred without the manipulation, lies, dishonesty, deceit and illegal actions and techniques of Mazama Mood, making all of these convictions arguably unsafe especially when you consider that the police and the Crown Prosecution Service never disclosed to me or any other fake shape victim what they knew from 1994 about the fact that he could not and should not ever be trusted as a witness of truth again and what they knew from 1999, namely that he edited and messed with recordings. Please share this far and wide. Go and discover more at circusofthemind.net.